Uh, welcome to the Indian Country uh, Criminal Jurisdiction Panel. Uh, we're excited to have this panel moderated by UW Law Professor Cecilia Klingel. Cecilia Klingel is an associate professor at the University of Wisconsin Law School, where she teaches courses in criminal law, constitutional criminal procedure, policing and sentencing, and corrections. She is also a faculty associate at the Frank J. Remington Center and the Lafayette School of Public Affairs and in the Institute of Research on Poverty. Uh, after receiving her JD from the University of Wisconsin Law School in 2005, uh, Professor Klingel served as law clerk to Chief Judge Barbara B. Crabb of the United States District Court for the Western District of Wisconsin, uh, Judge Susan H. Black of the United States Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit, um, and was associate and was a clerk with Associate Justice John Paul Stevens of the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, she returned to the UW faculty in 2009 as a visiting assistant professor um, and has been a permanent faculty member since 2011. Uh, professor Klingel, thank you for being here um, and for moderating this panel. The floor is yours. Thank you. It is an honor and a privilege to be here with such a distinguished uh, panel of guests today. I want to welcome you all to the Indian Country Criminal Jurisdiction Panel. Um, in this panel, we will hear presentations from Dean Kevin Washburn, Professor Angela Riley, and Attorney uh, Troy Ide about various topics related to Indian Country Criminal Jurisdiction, Indian status, and its impact on jurisdiction and the ongoing implementation of McGirt. CLE credits are available for this panel in the states of Arizona, California, Colorado, Illinois, Iowa, Maine, Michigan, Minnesota, Pennsylvania, Washington, and Wisconsin. You can thank uh, our law students for their hard work in setting all of those up. For those attending virtually, there will be secret words. This is my favorite part of this panel, administered uh, uh, by, uh, actually by me, not the panelists, throughout the presentations, uh, which are you, you are going to use to verify your attendance at this panel for CLE purposes. You must indicate your secret words on the CLE handout provided to you via email before this event. Please pay attention as they are necessary in order for you to receive that all important CLE credit for attendance today. For those of you who are here in the room in person, uh, please track the minutes that you spend at this panel and indicate that on your CLE form, which is available on the Wisconsin Law Review Symposium webpage if you don't have it already. There are background materials that accompany this pre panel's presentations. Um, please visit the Wisconsin Law Review Symposium website to download these materials if you have not done so already. And there are QR codes posted at the registration table and around the room that will connect your device to that webpage directly. <laughs> At the end of presentations today, we will have a short uh, Q&A period. If you have a question and are attending virtually, we ask that you provide the question in the chat and we will preserve it until the end of the pres uh, presentations. If you are in person and have a question, just raise your hand and one of our volunteers here in the room um, will bring you a microphone. We'll alternate for Q&A uh, between in-person questions and our online forum. Uh, please note, we're gonna try to get to all of your questions, but given time constraints, that is uh, probably not gonna happen. Finally, we'd like to remind everyone uh, that masks must be worn at all times during presentations, Q&A sessions, um, and while walking in the law school per university rules. And now uh, for the main event, uh, I would like to introduce our panelists. In William Hines, Dean and Professor of Law, Kevin Washburn joins us, uh, joined Iowa Law as its 18th Dean in 2018. Previously, Dean Washburn served as Dean and Professor of Law at the University of New Mexico Law School, as well as Assistant Secretary of Indian Affairs at the United States Department of the Interior under President Obama. Dean Washburn earned his BA from the University of Oklahoma and his JD from Yale Law School. Before joining academia, he clerked at the Ninth Circuit, was a prosecutor with the Wisconsin, or, sorry, with the Department of Justice and was general counsel of the National Indian Gaming Commission. Dean Washburn has taught and published several case books and is a citizen of the Chickasaw Nation of Oklahoma. Next to him is Professor Angela Riley, who is a professor of law at UCLA School of Law and director of UCLA's Native Nations Law and Policy Center. She directs the JDMA Joint Degree Program in Law and American Indian Studies and has been published in the Yale Law Journal, Stanford Law Review, Columbia Law Review, and numerous other uh, publication outlets. Professor Riley's research focuses on indigenous people's rights with a particular emphasis on cultural property and native governance. She's a citizen 
citizen of, um, sorry, you lost my place, citizen of the citizen of Potawatomi Nation, and um, in 2003 became the first woman and youngest justice of her tribe's Supreme Court. In 2010 and 2016, she was elected by the tribe's general council to serve as chief justice. Professor Riley received her BA from the University of Oklahoma, her JD from Harvard Law School, and is a member of the American Law Institute. Attorney Troy Ide is a principal shareholder in the Denver office of Greenberg LP, where he co-chairs the firm's American Indian Law Practice Group. He represents companies in criminal and civil investigations and enforcement actions, and is a highly sought media mediator to resolve complex disputes between Indian tribes and energy companies and between tribes and state governments. Mr. Ide previously served as Colorado's 40th United States attorney, appointed by President George Bush during the Obama and during the Obama administration, was appointed to the chair um, to the chair uh, to chair the Indian Law and Order Commission. <clears throat> Currently, Mr. Ide serves as the elected president of the Navajo Nation Bar Association, which he tells me some of our uh, alums have participated in, uh, and he recently competed in the Boston Marathon. Perhaps the most impressive accomplishment <laughs> yet. Um, it is my great pleasure to welcome each of you here to the University of Wisconsin Law School. We will hear the panelists in the order in which they were introduced. Um, so please join me in welcoming Dean Washburn to the podium. Thank you for the kind introduction. It's such a pleasure to be here. Um, I, this is the, my favorite time of the year. It's fall in the upper Midwest, and it's a it's a beautiful thing. I think we're, my law school is the, probably the closest law school to Madison, um, other than, you know, other than this one. So we're very, very close and we're kind of sister schools. And that was, um, it's just a beautiful time of year. And so this picture I thought captured it. This is University of Iowa College of Law on the left, the, the building on the left there. Um, so I have been, in, been involved in this project pretty much since the very beginning, and um, I, but not very much. I mean, I was, I was the dean of a, a law school, then I became the assistant secretary for Indian Affairs, and then I became dean of another law school. And so I haven't been a very good contributor because I've been a bureaucrat most of that time. Um, but, but Matthew and Winona and Kane, they demonstrated one of the most important Indian traits um, ever known, which is persistence. Mm -hmm. And over 10 years, they persisted um, as, as Native American tribes have, and um, that they've been a real inspiration. And um, wow, just wow, getting this thing to completion. It's really, it's a major accomplishment. Um, I wouldn't, it would, when it went into a foreign environment, not a hostile environment so much, but a very, very foreign environment and had to educate a whole bunch of people to get this this done and they did so with grace and um, and with persistence so so good work um, the spirit of my contact my, my my participation today is basically starting to work on the second restatement <laughs> because it's, I'm bringing to talk about things that I didn't bring up in the first restatement but I, but it's been something that's kind of been bugging me for for quite a while and so that's kind of what I'm going to talk about it's about the law this has been a really unusual pro uh, project you heard a little bit about it yesterday um, from a variety of people but um, you know, most of the restatements, the restatement of property, the restatement of contracts, the restatement of torts are based on common law subjects. And um, there was a big debate even within the, the committee that was working on this about whether there is such a thing as federal common law. The Deputy Solicitor General of the United States, Edward Needler, was vehement that there is no such thing as federal common law that you know federal courts are courts of limited jurisdiction they don't have the authority to make common law he was he was serious about that and he's the deputy solicitor general of the united states the guy who's argued more supreme court cases than any other living person and and he's a really smart guy besides um and um and and and, and that's an interesting thing i think in indian law i think a lot of us professors professor riley and i and and troy we we, we think of a lot of this law as common law, right? It doesn't, the Supreme Court isn't very good oftentimes in citing to statutes or to the Constitution when it makes pronouncements. Um, they've been doing it for a couple of centuries. They, 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 they kind of seem to be doing common law, right? They are not rooting and anchoring it in, in strong things. My own expertise is criminal justice in Indian country and um, the Kagama case, which set forth the, the Congress's authority to um, 
passed the Major Crimes Act and um, and um, supported that. Basically, the you know the, it's sometimes been called the 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 power, the congressional plenary power to to um, to adopt the Major Crimes Act has been characterized as the it must be somewhere doctrine because the Supreme Court pretty clearly said it doesn't come from the Commerce Clause, but they must have the power from somewhere. And um, that was kind of an interesting formulation, but it just feels like common law is what the court's been doing here. Um, but again, it's not really, perhaps. <laughs> and so it's been an interesting project. And a lot of the, you know, as, as Matthew spoke about yesterday so eloquently, a lot of this is statutory, right? And so it's, it's putting a statute into the restatement, which is, you know, it, it's, an, it's an unusual project. It's an unusual way to do things. Um, so one of the areas where we have kind of an interesting um, situation is it, uh, that feels like common law is in the criminal justice area. And let me just say, in the criminal justice area, we are in a long tribal renaissance in criminal justice. Um, Professor Riley has written really extensively about this. It has been a, a, just a wonderful, wonderful thing um, um, by necessity in some respects because the public safety statistics um, in this area are atrocious. Um, the Native Americans are, um, Native American women are subject to, to sexual assault rape at a, at a higher rate than any other minority group. The homicide rates are, 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 are exceedingly high um, among Native Americans. You know, we're, you know, given the whole Black Lives Matter movement and all that, but people think that African Americans are, are the people most affected by police violence. Not true. It turns out Native Americans are killed at a higher rate um, by police than, than African Americans are. So we are a little bit invisible in some ways. And that's something that I think Native Americans have really been kind of focusing on in recent years. But the, the, you know, the, the story is rough. It's, it's a bad story from a public safety perspective. From a criminal justice perspective that, you know, my, in my tenure piece, one of the things I, I wrote was that, um, you know, it's up to tribes to solve this problem. The federal government's been working on this for, you know, um, a long time, 200 years, and, and it has, it's only gotten worse. The answer is tribal self-determination, and we are seeing it. We are seeing tribal self-determination in criminal justice supported significantly significantly, by the way, by the United States, right? Um, which is, which is good. It's, um, we just, you know, keep seeing good cases in this area. We've had good action by Congress and we anticipate maybe having more good action by Congress to expand tribal authority, um, to deal with Indian country criminal justice. Um, um, so there's been a lot of good work done in this area. Um, that said, um, we've got a, we need a lot of good work. There's a lot of the, there's a lot that needs to be done in this in this space. Um, the federal government's role here is still exceedingly important, and um, one of the portions of the you know the, the key part of the federal government's role here is um, uh, conducting the federal prosecutions for major crimes and other offenses and offenses involving non-Indians in Indian country. And so, one of the things the restatement does is it defines Indian status because there is no jurisdiction, there's no federal jurisdiction in Indian country unless there is a Native American involved. Um, um, the, um, um, that's, that's, that's one, th one thing we know, and um, that's, that's curious because certainly crime on an Indian reservation that doesn't involve Native Americans nevertheless affects Indian reservations and Indian tribes. Uh, and, you know, crime in our communities harm all of us, right? Um, but this is one of the curious features that's existed for 150 years or something like that, that you have to have a Native involved, you have to have an Indian involved. And so one of the things that requires the federal law to do is to define the Indian status. Um, Congress has something like 33 statutes. Congress has enacted something like 33 statutes in which it is defined Indian in different ways. Um, however, it has never defined Indian for purposes of the criminal statutes. Um, and it's been writing these statutes, statutes since the, the early 1800s. Um, um, the early Indian Trade and Intercourse Acts were the were the first uh, was one of the early Trade and Intercourse Acts was one of the first statutes to define or to use the term Indian and not define it. 
Um, but this is um, this is what we said in the restatement on Indian status, and um, this is the provision. And um, what I'm going to argue today is we got we've got A and B wrong, really. And um, and um, and so in our next, you know, the, the ALI and these restatements are an important law reform exercise. That's what they're about. It's about making the law right and restating the law in a way that's better. And so as we begin to, I, I'm sure Matthew and Winona just get exhausted when they think a second restatement. We just got finished with the first, but we have to start thinking about what it's going to look like. What do we do in the future? And so this is is my um, my effort to to take that on, um, or to start us thinking about that. So. One of the other complications, by the way, this is the comment, um, comment A um, to the comment B to the restatement. And it says in federal criminal prosecutions, Indian status of relevant criminal defendants and victims is considered an element of the offense and must be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, uh, it's really hard to prove something beyond a reasonable doubt in the United States today. <laughs> the facts, facts are kind of up for grabs. Um, it's this is a this is a real challenge. It's um, it's not um, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, um, but for the federal government to have jurisdiction. Um, uh, in a in a major crimes case, for example, and by the way, tribes don't really have the adequate authority to prosecute major crimes. So if someone commits homicide, a tribe can prosecute um, that person and sentence them up to uh, up to three years in prison. They can't. That's that's the maximum authority for the federal for for a tribal prosecution. So the United States really does still need to be involved, even with the tribal renaissance in criminal justice. Um, the, the federal government still needs to be involved. Um, and to do so, the federal government must prove that somebody involved in the case is a uh, Indian uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. And um, by the way, um, this is a little complicated to explain. How many people, by the way, have at least been exposed in an Indian law class or something like that to the criminal jurisdictional rules for Indian country? Okay, a few, but yeah, it's it's quite complicated. Um, it's not it's not at all simple. Um, and one of the complications is um, the United States to prosecute um, a major crime um, must prove that um, someone is. Uh, uh, they have to prove that there's an Indian involved, and um, the Indian and Major Crimes Act applies to Indian perpetrators. Um, if it's a non-major crime, the United States can still still prosecute the offense if there's a non-Indian involved. Um, if it's a if there's a federal or perhaps state statute under the Assimilated Crimes Act. So interestingly, if it's a non-major offense, the United States have to has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the Indian is the perpetrator, and that a non-Indian. Um, th that there's a non-Indian involved. Otherwise, the United States doesn't have jurisdiction other than for major crimes. So again, this is complicated, but for non-major crimes, the United States has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that there's an Indian and prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the victim is a non-Indian. Otherwise, there's no federal jurisdiction for that non-major crime. Um, and some of these non-major crimes are still serious crimes, and the United States prosecutes those. Um, so it's difficult, as we will see in a few moments, to prove that somebody is an Indian. It's also really difficult to prove a negative, to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the other person is a non-Indian. Um, beyond a reasonable doubt, there are 574 tribes in the United States. Um, you know, th this is always this has driven me nuts for years because, in theory. You know, how do you do that? How do you prove that they're not a member of, beyond a reasonable doubt of any of the 574 tribes in the United States? So proving non-Indian status in many respects is just as complicated as proving Indian status. Um, so so this is um, this is not a simple task that we've um, asked um, prosecutors to to do um, in courts and juries. Um, so again, this is just a sort of more summary version of the section 69 that I just put up, but we need proof of some quantum of Indian blood, 
um, whether or not that blood derives from a member of a federally recognized tribe and proof of membership in or affiliation with a federally recognized tribe. Um, those are the two prongs. And so I wanna talk just a little bit about each of them. And um, by the way, um, one of the things that um, we've, we've said over the years, um, and this is, um, this is um, something that law professors have said, there's a famous professor from the University of Iowa. Um, he was at the University of Iowa when he wrote this stuff, but Robert Clinton, who famously called this whole jurisdictional scheme a jurisdictional maze. And it's been picked up by other scholars, including Angela and I in various places. And, um, and it is, it is a maze. I mean, again, you've heard, you know, you, just from hearing me talk for the last five minutes, you probably got an inkling of how complicated this, this jurisdictional maze is. And it's, again, it's, that's the way we call it. So it's characterized by complexity, by extreme complexity. Um, and, um, and that's, that's, that's what we have. We're already dealing with a system that involves extreme complexity. And then we've got to define Indian status. And um, we have um, quite a, a complicated way of defining that. So the first one I'd like to talk about is, is prong A, the first prong, some quantum, quantum of Indian blood. And I'm actually, I think we may ha maybe have this wrong. <laughs> I'm not sure that this is actually required. Um, the, we, the, the case that's been cited for this most frequently is a case called the United States versus Rogers from 1846 by Chief Justice Roger Taney. Does that name ring a bell for anybody? <laughs> Can anybody remember another famous decision issued by um, Chief Justice Taney? Do you want an answer? What's that? <laughs> Dred Scott. Dred Scott, anybody? Um, now, um, Dred Scott famously um, has um, um, been superseded um, by the Reconstruction Amendments to the United States Constitution. Dred Scott is kind of considered as a, a, a low point in American jurisprudence, a highly racialized opinion um, that we fought a civil war um, to correct in, in many respects in the United States. And so Dred Scott is considered no longer good law um, in large part because the Reconstruction Amendments to the Constitution. And if you look at the West law and it's, you know, you, you, you look up Dred Scott, there's a little red flag next to the case, right? It's been overruled. It's been superseded. Um, that's Dred Scott. Well, if you read U.S. v. Rogers, you will see some really similar kind of language to Dred Scott. It's, it, and I mean, fairly offensive language. Um, the, um, the, the, Pretty much the the theory that Justice uh, Chief Justice Taney used to say that um, you need some quantum of Indian blood to be uh, native to be a native is that, uh, the facts of, of of the Rogers case were that a white man was adopted into the Cherokee tribe, and the question was is he considered a native because he's been adopted in, adopted into the tribe? Is he an Indian? And um, the basic justification that the Chief Justice uh, Taney used in that case was to say, really, do you know what kind of white man would be adopted into a tribe, would go to live with the Indians? And it's really negative. It's really, it's really, uh, I mean, it would make your skin, skin crawl to read the case. Uh, it's just outrageous racialization um, and in a, in a you know, really negative way of this whole subject. And, um, the question really for me is, is it still good law? And um, I'm, I think I'm going to argue, this is, by the way, this is just a work of pro in progress. I'm just testing some ideas here. This is what in academics we would call, a, a professor would be called a work in progress. This is just an idea that I'm testing out. I'm not sure if I believe all this myself yet, but I'm, I'm looking into it and I'm still doing the research. But... <laughs> What's kind of offensive about this case is that it, it I think it's also been superseded um, because the, the, the case that the, this, what this gets cited for is that you have to have some Indian blood to be a, to be part of a tribe. And interestingly, just as the Reconstruction Amendments amended and super, you know, got rid of the Dred Scott decision, 
Um, I'm pretty sure the Reconstruction Treaties got rid of the Rogers Principle. The Reconstruction Treaties with several of the tribes, basically um, the tribes in those treaties agreed to adopt their freedmen, their former slaves, into their tribes. And they've got no Indian blood. And so I think, I think the United States Congress in, in um, confirming those treaties also overruled U.S. v. Rogers. And so I think just as the Reconstruction Amendments overruled Dred Scott, I think the Reconstruction Treaties overruled Rogers. And so I don't think actually Rogers is still good law. Now, now it still it gets cited um, by courts. And, and I mean, in this context, it's, you know, some decisions still reach back to Rogers. So the courts have not recognized that it has been superseded. And indeed, if you go to Westlaw, it's got a yellow flag. It doesn't have a red flag. And interestingly, it cites to the yellow flag cites to um, Means versus Chinle Tribal Court, which is a Navajo decision. It's a Navajo court um, that is distinguishing Rogers um, and refusing to apply it. And um, that is the famous case, by the way, Russell Means um, was prosecuted. He was a non he was a non-Navajo who was prosecuted by the Navajo courts and um, brought in, tried to challenge that. And the Navajo courts said, no, sorry, we're going to exercise jurisdiction over you, even though you're not Navajo. So I'm, I'm, I'm making the, the claim that actually our first prong is actually wrong, that this is not, Rogers is no longer good law. Um, I think I'm gonna be willing to write that up, and, but I've gotta do some more research. But I think the first prong is actually perhaps mistaken in, in, the, in federal law and, um, and, may, in, you know, and maybe in the restatement second, we should correct that. Um, now, the other, the other prong um, is equally important. Um, and that's that you also have to have proof of, proof of membership or affiliation with a federally recognized tribe. And that's the second prong. And this, by the way, you know, Matthew told you yesterday that mostly what we did in the restatement, we had to find a case, right? Anything we said, we had to find the case. So I'm not criticizing what we what is written in the restatement. It is correct as a matter of federal case law. But I actually think maybe we have um, taken the wrong path here as well. And um, and I will I will explain why um, as we go forward. So so one of the the things this requires um, this affiliation with is the is the complicated part right here the um, proof of membership in or affiliation with a federally recognized tribe. Um, it's the affiliation with part that I have a problem with and. Um, and here's the here's the, the, the theory. Here's the, here's what the cases say. It's a multi-factor test um, um, to determine whether someone is is um, meets the second prong of the Indian status. And um, enrollment in a tribe, by the way, usually is adequate. If you've got enrollment in a tribe, that is enough to establish Indian status. That is usually considered enough. Keep in mind also you have to have prong A, which is you know Indian blood. But 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 A is uh, if you've got enrollment in a tribe, that usually satisfies it. That is the, the, this one court, a Ninth Circuit said this is declining order of importance. So number one is the most important, but number number one is sufficient in most cases. So the question is, what if we get someone who is not enrolled in a tribe? Then we've got to go to factors two, three, and four. Um, if you're a prosecutor and you've got to prove something beyond a reasonable doubt, um, you don't necessarily want a mushy multi-factor test. <laughs> you want some clarity. Um, but um, but basically, what what what's the you know two, three, and four are government recognition of some sort of some kind, and um, um, evidence that the person enjoys the benefits of of being of a tribal membership, tribal affiliation, um, even if they're not formally enrolled or social recognition. The, the people in the community treat you as a member of the community in essence. And um, the, the, you know, there's some, some problems with this formulation. And um, one of them is, is this one. Do we want bright lines in, in criminal law? Um, um, or do we want sort of mushy, ambiguous, um, multi-factor tests? <laughs> um, why might we want bright lines in criminal law? Anybody have a sense? 
Notice. Notice. Good judge. Notice. Notice. People ought to have notice whether the law applies to them. That's that's a that's a good one. Um, and um, another one. Um, yeah. Institutional capacity that decreases the workload on the courts by providing yep. clarity. Consistency. That's right. That, no, that's good. That's um, those are important values. Due process, right? I mean, people are entitled to notice about if criminal law applies to them. Because you know why? We might throw them in jail if if the law applies to them, right? They deserve to know whether they fit within that category or not. That's kind of the big the big thing here. So um, so bright lines are important. And let me just turn to one more thing, and then I will I'm going to sit down in just a minute. But um, but and and that's and that's this. Um, which respect which approach is more respectful of tribal sovereign decisions um, basically if we're defining indian status we are saying who is a member of this community um, do we want tribes determining who is recognized as a member of their community or do we want federal judges and federal juries determining that question Maybe I don't need to answer that question. <laughs> um, but I think, in other words, that this mushy multi-factor test is not the right approach. And I think, and this is the other, so, so I think we're wrong on prong A, as I said earlier. I think we're wrong on prong B, too. I think that the, what the law ought to say is that tribal membership is the test, that we respect tribal decisions as to who um, their members are. And, um, and that's, that's, that ought to be our approach. Um, so so for restatement second of American Indian law, I'm going to be working to get section 69 and the law fixed um, in this area so that we are more respectful for tribes. We have brighter lines, which is good for criminal law, and, um, and we, we really revisit this whole question of Indian status. And um, so that's, the, that's, that's my pitch and on, on one section of this enormous <laughs> work that we, that we put together. Thank you. Lest I forget, for those of you who are uh, online, offenses is your first secret word. Offenses. And Professor Riley will be up next. Bonjour. Is this working? Hi. Uh, nice to see you all here. Um, I want to start by acknowledging the the yep yeah, that's okay um acknowledging the ho-chunk uh, on whose land we're we're sitting today thank you miigwech i uh, also want to just thank the the wisconsin law review and dylan and uh crystal and no problem and all of you for all the hard work you've done putting this together it's been really fantastic and of course thanks to my dear friends who created the restatement uh, matthew winona and kane it's just a, as everyone has already noted a really remarkable achievement um, so it's a little intimidating to be on a criminal jurisdiction panel with Troy Ide and Kevin Washburn. Uh, they really are the experts. I actually have not, never really worked that much in criminal law, um, but got deeply invested in a lot of the research um, after the Volvo reauthorization was passed and, and did a lot of work studying the, the, the cases that were coming out of tribal courts regarding prosecution of non-Indian defendants who had committed acts of domestic violence. And that's really kind of was my entry point. Um, but what I'm gonna talk about today, uh, I, I, my, my talk has a title, there we go, um, Double Jeopardy, Dual Sovereignty, and Dinespe. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about uh, the case that the Supreme Court has recently accepted cert on, which many of you may be familiar with, um, the Dinespe case, which raises a double jeopardy issue. Um, so let me tell you, let me tell you kind of how I'm going to walk, walk you through this. Um, what I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get to the Dines P case where you may be familiar. It involves a double jeopardy challenge arising out of the Ute Mountain Ute Tribes prosecution of Dines P in a CFR court, and then a subsequent federal prosecution in a U.S. District Court um, arising out of the same underlying incident. Um, so I want to split my time between Dines P, but then I want to start by really bringing you um, through the. Supreme Court cases both inside and outside of Indian law um, that pertain to the prescription of double jeopardy and the dual sovereignty exception and how we, how we get there. Um, as you're aware, constitutional protections against double jeopardy um, 
clause um, protects someone from being put in jeopardy twice for the same offense. Um, and despite this protection, we have what's called the dual sovereign carve out, which is that two prosecutions are not for the same offense if they're brought by different sovereigns, even when those actions target the ident target identical criminal conduct through equivalent criminal laws. So in other words, if two entities derive their power to punish from independent sources, then they may bring successive prosecutions. And conversely, if they if those entities draw their power from the same ultimate source, then they may not. So under this theory, of course, states are separate sovereigns from the federal government and from one another. So the question of whether tribes are separate sovereigns for this same purpose, I went to the Supreme Court in 1978 in a case many of you may be familiar with called U.S. v. Wheeler. Um, and in that case, you had a Navajo defendant that was prosecuted first by the Navajo Nation for a lesser included offense, and then subsequently by the federal government for the greater encompassing offense arising from the same incident. So the court there had to face the question of whether double jeopardy attached. And the ultimate issue then was, are tribes separate sovereigns um, just like states from the federal government? Um, the court in that case said that the tribe was and tribes are um, separate sovereigns. Therefore, they can they can benefit from the dual sovereign carve out to double jeopardy. And they were very focused in Wheeler in particular on whether the tribe's um, criminal authority to prosecute was inherent or whether it had been delegated by the federal government. And the court concluded that tribes have inherent tribal sovereignty to prosecute crimes by Indians on Indian reservations. Um, and so therefore, there was no double jeopardy problem. Um, the court reiterated the dual sovereignty doctrine with regard to Indian tribes in U.S. v. Lara when it upheld in 2004, when it upheld the so-called Duro fix, which was a, a legislative fix to the Duro case. Um, and, and essentially, the Duro fix just made it clear that tribes have inherent tribal sovereignty to prosecute crimes by any Indian on an Indian reservation, not just a, a, tr a tribal member Indian, meaning of their own tribe. Um, so this is an interesting, you know, one of the interesting complexities in the jurisdictional maze that is criminal jurisdiction. So in other words, um, I'm Potawatomi. If I committed a crime at Navajo, I could be prosecuted by Navajo. Um, so given this, this kind of lay of the land, the, the ALI restatement, of course, deals with the double jeopardy question and the dual sovereignty question in, in uh, section 76. And, and I think what it states there is it really reiterates the court's holding in Wheeler and Lara. Um, and the actual language is um, because the power of Indian tribes to prosecute and convict offenders derives from a tribe's inherent sovereignty, prior or subsequent federal or state prosecutions of the same offenders for the same crimes um, are allowable. But as I'll get to in just a second, this novel question that's raised by Denespi, and by the way, I can't believe this has never gone up to the court before. I don't know, it's just, we were just discussing this. Um, and I hope we have some time to actually talk because when we, we had a planning call to talk about today's, uh, today's discussion and we might have different views on how the court should come out in, Den in Denespi and, and what, what its implications might be. Um, but the restatement, of course, in my view, states the law correctly on this point, but it takes us only up to what Wheeler and Lara did. Um, the, at that point, we hadn't had a case like Denespi where we'd had a CFR court prosecution at the tribal level and then a subsequent federal prosecution. So in order to really mine this question and really figure out what's going on with the dual sovereignty doctrine, we have to really go outside of the Indian law canon. And so I want to do that by starting with the court's 2016 decision in the case of Puerto Rico versus Sanchez Vi. And I don't speak Spanish, so if I'm butchering anything, just forgive me. But um, there, the court was faced with the question of whether Puerto Rico constituted a separate sovereign for purposes of double jeopardy. And in that case, Kagan writes for the majority. She applied the dual sovereignty precedent and ultimately concluded that Puerto Rico is not a separate sovereign for purposes of double jeopardy. Um, so Puerto Rico and the United States derive their sovereignty from the same source. So, that, so she said, and therefore you can, the double jeopardy does attach. Um, a couple of things there that happened that are interesting. One, the court um, reaffirmed that the test for determining whether two prosecuting governments are considered separate sovereigns for purposes of double jeopardy, 
is, and I'm quoting now from the case, whether the prosecutorial powers of the two jurisdictions have independent origins or said conversely, whether those powers derive from the same ultimate source. So that's the quote from Sanchez Vibe. Now, that case in dicta um, reiterated that tribes meet this historical test and that tribes are separate sovereigns. And the case, um, also this is a quote from the case, a tribal prosecution like a state's is attributable in no way to any delegation of federal authority. And that alone is what matters for the double jeopardy inquiry. So that's what we have in Sanchez Vi. But there's a couple of things that um, are also going on in that case that I think are important to mention. In terms of the concurrences and the dissent, so Ginsburg filed a concurring opinion, uh, which Thomas joined, and she supports the majority's opinion, but challenges the dual sovereignty doctrine altogether. So she, you know, it was was opposed to the idea of du the dual sovereignty carve out exception to double jeopardy overall. Um, Thomas felt the need to write separately and reiterate that he was concurring in the judgment, but he wrote separately to emphasize that Indian tribes, in his view, do not qualify as separate sovereigns in relation to double jeopardy and successive prosecutions. So he doesn't buy that tribes should be able to avail themselves um, of separate sovereignty. And then Breyer dissented and Sotomayor joined um, essentially making the argument that Puerto Rico is and was a separate sovereign. But in making that argument, they tie it to um, the argument about Indian tribes and say that it's entirely inconsistent to say that tribes have independent sovereignty, but, uh, but Puerto Rico doesn't. So those are the, the opinions um, in, in Sanchez Vibe. A few years later, um, the Supreme Court accepted certain another case that you probably were, are familiar with. There was a big amicus briefing project around this case because of its potential implications in Indian country, and that was U.S. v. Gamble. That case was decided in 2019. Um, and in that case, the Supreme Court actually was taking up the question of whether it should overrule the separate sovereign exception to double jeopardy altogether. And that case arose because, again, out of the same incident, Gamble faced dual prosecution. Um, in that case, his federal prosecution came first and his state prosecution was subsequent. Um, in that one, Alito wrote for the majority and upheld the separate sovereigns doctrine, mostly um, a, a, an opinion heavily, it just heavily weighted by stare decisis, essentially. We've always done this. We're going to stick with it. Um, Ginsburg again dissented on the ground that the dual sovereignty exception violates the double jeopardy clause. And interestingly, for our purposes, maybe, um, Gorsuch also uh, dissented and wrote a separate dissent in Gamble, um, essentially arguing that the separate sovereign's exception to the bar against double jeopardy is unconstitutional. So obviously, as we know, Ginsburg has passed and is not on the court anymore, um, but Gorsuch seems to also um, have similar <coughs> concerns about the constitutional implications of a separate sovereign's doctrine. <clears throat> okay, so... While all of this was happening, there was a case that arose um, on the Northern Cheyenne Reservation. Um, in that case, um, a woman by the name of Tanya Bear comes out, faced dual prosecution for homicide, first by the um, Northern Cheyenne tribe and then by the United States. So she too um, challenged her conviction and argued that double jeopardy barred her successive homicide prosecutions in on kind of a novel argument. And her argument was that um, because the two entities, um, the tribe and the federal government, are not separate sovereigns because of the significant financial and regulatory oversight of the Northern Cheyenne tribe and the Cheyenne court by the federal government. So there were also some arguments about treaty rights and and powers that had been, um, you know, sort of wielded to the United States and so forth. So that was that was her argument, that the two had actually become conflated. Um, the Ninth Circuit rejected the ar argument, um, just full stop, and upheld her conviction under the Separate Sovereigns Doctrine and relied heavily on Puerto Rico versus Sanchez Vi. The Supreme Court denied cert right after it decided Gamble. Um, so I just want to kind of put a pin in that in Bear Comes Out um, failed arguments um, because I, I want to return to the, the, the potential importance of those arguments in a second. <clears throat> okay, so now... I want to talk about Dinespe. 
Um, and, and like I said, I do this with, uh, with great humility. There are um, the Navajo Nation <laughs> uh, Bar Association president is here and people who know a lot more about this case probably than I do. Um, everything I know is from just reading the materials. I also want to just, you know, address that I, I have sensitivity talking about these cases because I know that when we talk about these cases, we're talking about people's families. These are people that we know, um, sometimes the victim, sometimes the perpetrator. So I just, I come to it with that, with that spirit. Um, in the Dinesby case involved, um, it, it, and, the, and the Supreme Court accepted search. So we're going to see what's going to happen here. Um, a Navajo man who committed several criminal acts related to the sexual assault of a Navajo woman on the Ute Mountain Ute Reservation. Um, after the victim reported the incident to the police, law enforcement arrested Dinesby in 2017, and he was charged by complaint in the Court of Indian Offenses of Ute Mountain Ute Agency, um, which is a CFR court um, because it's found, uh, the regulations are found in the Code of Federal Regulations. And he was charged with three offenses. The first and second were terrorist threats and imprisonment, and those were uh, charges that were set forth in the CFR code. The third was assault and battery, which was defined um, and set forth in the Ute Mountain Ute Code. The caption on the complaint in the court is United States of America versus Dinespe, and all pleadings in that case um, are likewise captioned. So Dinespe entered a plea in the CFR court, but he pled only to the Ute Mountain Ute offense um, in exchange for the other two CFR counts being dropped. He received a sentence of 140 days, but was released on time served. Six months later, um, he was charged by indictment in the U.S. District Court for the District of Colorado um, based on the same conduct underlying the charges from the CFR court conviction. And the caption on the indictment in that case is United States of America versus Dinespe, and all the pleadings in the case, again, are likewise captioned. So Dinesby appeals to the federal district court in Colorado, challenging his subsequent prosecution on double jeopardy grounds, arguing that the CFR court essentially operates under federal and tribal authority, and therefore a subsequent federal prosecution in federal district court violates double jeopardy. Um, interestingly, Dinespe's um, pleadings concede that if the Ute Mountain Ute Court was a tribal court, and not a CFR court, then Wheeler would govern and there would be no double jeopardy issue. Um, but here, Dinesby argues that the source of authority for the CFR court, while it may be partially tribal, is equally federal. And this hybrid nature means the dual sovereignty exception to double jeopardy does not apply. Um, Federal District Court denied Dinesby's appeal and the Tenth Circuit affirmed. Um, in upholding the District Court's ruling, the Tenth Circuit really focused its attention on the dual sovereignty line of cases, particularly Sanchez Vi, to answer the question of whether Dinesby's CFR prosecution was federal and therefore the subsequent prosecution violated the prescription on double jeopardy. Again, quoting Sanchez Vi, the court focused on um, the dual sovereignty test hinges on a single criterion, the ultimate source of the power undergirding the respective prosecutions. Um, the court went on to say this inquiry, and this is also citing back to Sanchez Vi, um, the inquiry is thus historical, not functional, looking at the deepest wellsprings, not the current exercise of prosecutorial authority. So based on this analysis, the district court and then the 10th Circuit subsequently determined um, that the CFR court is just a forum through which tribes inherent sovereignty to exercise criminal jurisdiction is, um, is animated. Um, the, the fact that the CFR court was set up by the United States um, is, is, does not mean that this is a federal prosecution, that the actual inherent tribal sovereign authority is what gives rise to the criminal jurisdiction. So now, of course, the Supreme Court has the case, and the question is, is the Court of Indian Offenses of the Ute Mountain Ute Agency a federal agency such that Dinesby's conviction in that court barred his subsequent prosecution in a U.S. District Court for a crime arising out of the same incident? So that's, that kind of leads us up to where we are, and I just wanted to say a couple of words before I close about what I think the implications um, of this case might be for, for Indian law and for Indian country. 
Um, on the one hand, we might consider the negative implications of a ruling that CFR courts are federal to be ameliorated by a couple of things. Um, first, there are only five regional CFR courts remaining in the United States. Um, they impact around 15 tribes. Most of them are in Oklahoma. So in the scheme of things, it's, it's not a lot of tribes that are actually still operating under the CFR court system. And it's possible that a ruling against, um, a ruling that CFR courts are essentially federal might be the, a motivation for those courts to move from the CFR model to the tribal court model. But of course, there could be serious um, public safety concerns um, and issues around justice for victims in the interim period because of tribes sentence limitations on tribal sentencing authority, among other things. A lot of these tribes, uh, a lot of these CFR courts actually are out where I grew up. So I'm very familiar, very familiar with the issues and, and with the with the tribes. Um, but just to close, I just want to add that I have an additional concern, and I'm just going to circle back around to Bear Comes Out. Um, because that argument, which again was rejected, that there's so much federal funding, influence, and collaboration between the federal government and the tribal court that the tribal prosecution was essentially federal. What my concern is, is that um, the arguments around the CFR court, although different because the actual establishment of CFR courts was very specific um, and, and done in a different way than, than tribal courts, even tribal courts that receive a lot of federal funding. With the current comp composition of the Supreme Court, I have a concern that a ruling that a CFR court is federal could potentially open the door for double jeopardy challenges dealing with subsequent federal prosecutions and tribal court prosecutions where the tribal court, um, let's say, is heavily funded or supported by the federal government. And I'm afraid that they that line might not be as clear to the Supreme Court as it is to those of us who work in Indian country and, and understand the, the distinct history between tribal courts and CFR courts. Um, the implications for public safety on reservations under that scenario could be um, quite dire. Um, again, because oftentimes because of the sentencing limitations that tribes face, tribes oftentimes rely on a subsequent federal prosecution to actually um, administer some degree of justice for what can be very serious crimes. And I think, you know, in this moment, especially when we're, we're focused in many things in Indian country, but certainly on the situation involving missing and murdered indigenous women and girls, among others, um, those are some pretty weighty consequences if it is if, if it did open the door to that problem for tribes. So um, with that, I will I will conclude. Thank you all very much, and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Before I forget, the next secret word is crimes. Crimes. So thank you very much. How many of you are from Wisconsin? I'm just curious. How many of you are actually real badgers? Actually <laughs> from the badger land. So, so I, I just want to thank you. I want to thank the Ho Chunk people. And the ceremony yesterday was was a very moving ceremony, very moving tribute. But I, I want to thank you for another reason. Uh, my father came from Egypt in 1957 with 100 bucks. He was the first international student ever at Oshkosh. Um, he needed to get out of Egypt in a hurry after the Suez crisis. Most of our family was executed uh, when Nasser took power, and we had very little. And uh, I'm not entirely sure how my late grandfather was able to get my late father out of Egypt. Uh, that's a shrouded mystery, but he did have a, he came legally on a student visa. And he ended up in Oshkosh and he met my mother uh, and my, we still have my mom. She just beat back cancer for a year and a half during COVID and uh, she's 80 and doing great. But I grew up uh, in Colorado after I spent my first years in Wisconsin in Oshkosh and at my grandparents' place in Wapaka County. Uh, my grandpa was from Iola, if you know where Iola is. And my grandma was from Marion. 
And uh, they, in a marital compromise, lived in Clintonville. So I spent every summer, uh, all the way up through high school, big chunks of time. And I, I really had an incredible experience. And I really have always considered Wisconsin to be uh, a refuge for us. Um, you have to understand what it's like, especially those of you who are not immigrants or first generation in that sense, uh, when you can't go back to your country. We literally were not allowed because of our blood quantum. Uh, we had Ottoman blood that was prohibited from the royal family, but it was 600 years old. So we didn't get a lot of real estate or anything out of that. <laughs> uh, but we couldn't go back legally. And so uh, it was very good to have a place to be able to land. And for us, that was actually Oshkosh of all places. So I, I just wanted to thank you for the chance. It, it's very emotional to come to, to Wisconsin and to be able to participate in something like this. It means a lot to us and to our family. I also want to thank my wife who uh, uh, Alice and I, she's a judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit. She's on the LI Council. She's, you can wave your hand, uh, Judge Eyed. And, uh, you know, those of you who have not already talked about clerkships, you know, I appreciate that. Uh, she she had the, her family, the Macaulay Dairy in Oshkosh, although we're not related. We have done the DNA work. We have no <laughs> connection to each other. Look at her. We are not related. So you always marry up if you have a chance. But we've been married 32 years and uh, appreciate the fact that she came out uh, to, to keep an eye on me here. So there are actually, how many stages of grief are there? How many stages? Anybody know? Five. five. Dean Washburn, good job. <laughs> okay, what are the five stages of grief? Denial. Denial. Number one. Number two is what? Anger. Anger. Three is a little bit hard. Bargaining. Bargaining. Well, I guess good job, Professor Riley. Four is what? Suppression, right? Suppression. And then what happens at the very end if you get through the grief cycle? Exactly. All right. So for McGirt, I wanted to do McGirt v. Oklahoma, the five stages of grief. But the problem is that we're still in denial and a little bit anger, right? Maybe a lot of anger. So it's just a short presentation. It doesn't work very well. So I have the drama, the McGirt drama in four acts. Um, those of you who have seen Sherlock Holmes, it doesn't really fit, but it's a drama in four acts. The drama in four acts, you've got the court is recognition, right? The court recognizes that these treaties still have validity. And the fact that uh, you've got the land reserved in 1866 pursuant to treaty uh, for the Creek Nation, the Muscogee Nation, it's still Indian country for purposes of the Major Crimes Act, right? That's the holding of McGirt. The treaty still has validity and Congress did not disestablish or diminish that reservation for purposes of the Major Crimes Act. So recognition of the treaty, and, and it's exciting to see the treaty jurisprudence. I would argue with you that I think it's transformative in Indian law for so many reasons that you can actually have a court and get five votes to say the treaty means what it says. And if you can't prove that it wasn't undone, that's the law of the land. And if Congress doesn't like it, well, Congress could do something about it, of course. But that's essentially the holding of McGirt. So the first, the first act is the recognition on July 20th of 2020 when the court held this by a 5-4 vote. Second act is what? Defiance. <clears throat> You know, I said, we can't just do denial and then anger, but you know, defiance. How many times, how many times has the state of Oklahoma filed now since McGirt to undo McGirt, to say either rehear it or reverse it? How many, how many cases, how many people know, how many petitions have they filed total? Fewer than 10, more than 10? How many people think fewer than 10? How many people think more than 10? How many people think more than 20? How many people think more than 30? Would you believe 38 times? Now, how do we not know that? I understand that many of us are not into Indian law. I got that. But how do we not understand that a state is continuing to defy the U.S. Supreme Court? Do we think that just happens what, at the Trail of Tears and the Apocrypha? Well, that wasn't even the court, right? The court ruled, and then Andrew Jackson just did what he wanted to do. We've all learned that about the Trail of Tears, right? Or was it after Brown versus Board? Well, we'll spend 10 years of violence in the South, 
right? Because we didn't, some people didn't like what the court did. And they were, the Fifth Cir Circuit, uh, where Alice and I both clerked for judges, was really working hard to desegregate, but some of them were not, and they were fighting, and there was just this very rough time. People forget after Brown for more than 10 years where the court argued about this. And on the ground, right, you had Arkansas, you had Governor Faubus, you had all these cast of characters that were defying the court. But what about in our lifetime? What about today while we sit here? Does anybody realize? Let me just, to, in terms of defiance, I had to write this down so I don't misspeak. The current Oklahoma Attorney General, October 22nd, quote, no U.S. Supreme Court decision in history has had a more immediate and destabilizing effect on the life in any American state than McGirt, unquote. <laughs> now, he's just appointed, right? They don't elect them in Oklahoma, so, but they do elect governors. So Kevin Stitt is the governor of Oklahoma. What did he say in a statement the same day? Quote, McGirt is the biggest issue that's ever hit any state since the Civil War, unquote. You think that that's true? Is it bigger than Brown versus Board? No. Is it is it bigger than any issue we've ever faced since the Civil War? I mean, Kevin spoke eloquently about the Civil War, the Reconstruction Amendments, persuasively too. I hope you write that up soon before someone else publishes it in this group. And <laughs> the SSRN or whatever it is. So, no, but seriously, this is a governor, elected governor of state. This is the biggest issue any state has faced any state since the Civil War. And then later that day, Oklahoma is literally being torn into pieces. This cannot stand, unquote. Are, is anyone paying attention to what's happening in Oklahoma? This is, this is a profoundly interesting experience that's happening. Now, unless since I heard some partisan comments, and I am a Republican, I know I need to head for the bathroom or something to hide out if someone notices. And I, I've been that way for a long time. You can't help me, and I'm too far gone. <laughs> but you've got Rep. Tom Cole, who's the senior Republican in the House. And he's a member of the Chickasaw Nation, right? He's been trying really hard to fix this situation however he can. And he pointed out the same day that this happened that the tribes in Oklahoma are paying $4.5 billion just as employers in direct payments. They are one of the biggest employers in the whole state of Oklahoma. And they did the total economic impact to the state $13 billion a year. That's a lot of money in Oklahoma, really anywhere. And he has been, and this is really the, the third part of the, the methodology because he and the others, in the Congress have been talking about what to do. And we would just say the third act is indecision because the Congress has done nothing at all. Tom Cole's tried to get money to deal with the effects of Oklahoma uh, post McGirt, which means what? You've got concurrent tribal jurisdiction in 40% of the state perhaps, right? Where before you had state jurisdiction over crimes involving Native Americans, right? And so there's a tremendous increase in the need to provide services by tribes and by the federal government. Cole tried to transfer $130 million, it didn't work. You've got lots of legislation pending in DC, but they haven't yet got around to doing something about the situation. So indecision, they could do some things that don't even cost money, like make it easier for intergovernmental agreements to be worked out, which is really important on the ground, and there are some cases where federal law does not permit that to happen in a seamless fashion. And they haven't done that. So the first act, the recognition by the courts, the second, the defiance by the state, the third act, the indecision of the feds really doing nothing. And it's been a long time. It's kind of remarkable they've done nothing, given that this is the biggest deal since the Civil War in any state. And then the fourth thing, and I'm not gonna to talk too long, I've got a big slide deck, but you know, for gosh sakes, we need to talk a little bit and you can look at the slides if you want. Um, you all know McGirt. The fourth act is perseverance by the tribes. Now I've been down there several times, uh, including as the guest of a uh, principal chief, David Hill of the Muskogee or Creek Nation. And it was amazing the first time I went down there, Chief Hill said, I want you to listen to something. He knew that I chaired the Indian Law and Order Commission in the Obama administration after I served in the Bush administration. 
what we did in the commission, we made some recommendations. Some of them were adopted by Congress and some of them weren't. One of the recommendations was what became the Violence Against Women Act amendments in 2013 and 2014, which recognized tribes' inherent authority over non-natives committing certain domestic violence crimes. We wanted to have more of them criminalized and more in tribal jurisdiction. There's obviously House legislation pending in the US Congress now. It's not moved, but you know, I pray that it will, that, that we'll get that reform as well and other reforms. But we made those kinds of recommendations. And so he knew I had that kind of background. I'd spent time down there before. I'd visited before when I, at the time when, when uh, Assistant Secretary Washburn was doing a wonderful job in that role. And he said, I want you to listen to something. And he played a 911 tape. And the 911 tape was a surreal 911 tape. Uh, there were actually several different recordings on the same tape of different 911s. One was in Tulsa, and, and there were two in other counties that were in the treaty area for uh, the, the Muscogee or Creek Nation, and one was actually Cherokee Nation. And there were cases, each one of them, where women were being brutalized by men, plainly, if you've ever listened to a 911 call, you kind of get the sense, especially when the woman is pleading, he's got a knife, he's coming at me, he's coming again. This is what we're listening to one of the calls. And the police dispatcher is saying, excuse me, are you an Indian? Is he an Indian? This is on a 911 call. You, you couldn't believe it unless you actually heard it. But you can go down there or you can, I'm sure, arra make arrangements with the Muscogee Nation uh, or, or with, I'm sure, uh, four or even other tribes now, Papa is the, perhaps the latest one, that the recognition by the state courts this last week, you can hear this kind of recording, which is literally that it's so dysfunctional on the ground at times in Oklahoma that literally police dispatchers are asking while people are being brutalized, is this the right jurisdiction? And what was happening and why we were having the meeting was, he said, we can't get them to hand off. So if they show up and they've got deputy sheriffs in two of the counties at that time, and this is continuing in other parts, as we know, if you read the news, and I have in some of my presentation here, that the arresting authorities show up and, oh, well, they're Indians. Rather than stay and secure the situation, kind of the opposite in this case of US v. Cooley, right? <laughs> You'd have the non-natives stabilizing things, and then the tribal police come. They leave, or they don't go. This is what's happening on the ground in parts of Oklahoma right now. And so you literally can have, in a state like Oklahoma, if you trace the way the law works, the attorney general is appointed. They have authority to be able to act in the criminal realm in a way that's different in some states. They can instruct the, the state's attorneys to be able to work with the local sheriffs and so on and the city of Tulsa police and the other municipal. So this would never happen but they're not doing it in many places. And it's just shocking. And so I wanted to just have a forum to tell you all, if you've not paid attention, you need to understand what's happening in Oklahoma. It's a serious, serious problem. And the, the, the chief of the, of the Cherokee Nation, the principal chief is Chuck Hoskin Jr. Uh, he said just this last week, quote, intergovernmental cooperation would be far more productive than hoping the Supreme Court will overturn its decision. Instead, the state of Oklahoma and the city of Tulsa, Tulsa, by the way, keeps joining the state now in these various petitions they're filing with some other municipalities. They seem more invested in creating barriers for tribal law enforcement than overcoming this problem. And they are holding up further collaboration Quote, dangerous uncertainty and instability is being created by the state's refusal to work with the tribe. And I think that it's a fair statement on the ground right now in Oklahoma. Now, you may ask yourself, how could the state, as has been publicly reported, devote $700,000 just this year to hiring outside law firms just to sue Oklahoma state citizens who are also tribal members? When do states sue their own citizens? Kevin and I experienced this in Alaska uh, 10 years ago, right? You had the same crazy situation where the state's been all the time suing Alaska natives. 
you, you got this going on in Oklahoma right now, where literally they are going to the court and saying, McGirt, we don't accept it. McGirt was wrong. McGirt was bad. And so just a couple thoughts. And again, I've got a presentation and, and, and I hope that you'll, if you're interested, you'll take a look at it because there's a lot of detail and a timeline as to how this is all unfolded. You know, number one, the resource needs are, are real. The tribes didn't get one extra dollar out of McGirt, right? There's no additional source of revenue for them. And yet they've had to step up in a very dramatic way. What am I talking about? Since McGirt, just in the Northern District of Oklahoma, which is the U.S. Attorney's District, there are three districts for U.S. Attorneys in the state of Oklahoma. The one that includes Tulsa and a few counties, they, they have opened 900 additional cases that relate to McGirt since July of 2020. That's a lot of cases. That, that's about triple what they would typically do for all federal cases in that district. It's a lot of cases. They, they have, out of the 900 they've opened, they've so far indicted about 450 of those cases. And as someone who's been a prosecutor, you know, you need agents, you need to be able to investigate, you need federal public defenders. There's a whole justice system that's, that feds need to step up and really focus on how are we going to recognize that the court has ruled and now we adjust. Congress has plenary power. Congress is responsible. The court said that in its opinion. It got five votes. Isn't that what we're supposed to do? The second thing is that they have also, just in the Northern District, and that's not the whole treaty area, they have referred 1,900 cases from the U.S. Attorney's Office just to the tribal prosecutors at Muskogee or Creek Nation and the Cherokee Nation. So 1,900 cases have come in there. They do not have additional government revenues. They did not get federal money for this purpose. There's other federal money for tribes in, in you know, relating to what President Biden is doing, but it's not related to this problem specifically. So keep in mind that they're now having to add judges as they're doing. You can read this online. Prosecutors, public defenders, <coughs> wraparound services for social, uh, social workers and so on that you must have in the justice system. But they're doing it without any additional revenues. They're just having to figure out how, how do we get this done? So it's, a, it's an incredible unsung story of tribal resilience when you think about it. We, we have our recognition. We, we, we now have the Supreme Court saying the treaty means what it says, but now we have to step up and no one's gonna help us. We have to help ourselves. Even though, frankly, there should be some assistance in fairness, right? I think anyone would say there ought to be when there's been this recognition that there was an error that went on since 1907, <laughs> there, might, there might be some recognition of a responsibility, if ever there was one, by the federal government, in some sense by the state, to not be spending its time and money filing 38 petitions to try to undo what's already been done. None of which, by the way, has resonated in any way to report, at least so far, with, with the U.S. Supreme Court. So I'm going to stop there. And I appreciate your time, and I thank you very much. Thank you very much to our panelists for those um, really meaty um, and helpful um, comments. Um, the third secret word for those of you online is punishment. <laughs> One of my favorites, punishments. Um, and now I think what we're going to do is open up um, to questions. This may be a silly question. Whatever happened to McGirt? Whatever happened to Jim C. McGirt? So, so McGirt was one of several, remember there was a case the prior term in the 2019 term and Justice Gorsuch had recused and then it was 4-4, so they decided to come back and hold this case over. So then you had a different, you had a different uh, defendant. He was re-sentenced federally and he got three successive life terms. And you can see this in my PowerPoint presentation. It, there's details about him and even a photograph. Great presentations, everybody. I've got questions for all of you, but I'm gonna just start with a, a couple quick questions for Kevin and, and give other people a turn. Um, 
first on the idea that the post-Civil War treaties may have altered the framework for, um, for Rogers. I think there may be support for that in a Supreme Court case from 1896, uh, Lucas v. United States, when the court said that a, an African-American in the Indian territory and associating with the Indians is presumptively an Indian. They were reversing a trial court decision that said that person is presumptively not Indian and therefore a, a U.S. citizen. Um, but I, I don't know, my, my question is whether the idea that the post-Civil War treaties maybe changed that framework would have only changed it for the five tribes. I mean, what do you do then with, say, the Kiowa Constitution, which says that someone who is one quarter or more Kiowa captive, presumptively possibly not Indian then, uh, is a tribal member? You know, would, would, Rogers, would the Rogers framework change where there wasn't that applicable treaty? So Rogers was a Cherokee case, and so it was one of those five tribes. And so, it, I mean, that's the case. I, I believe that's right. And so that's where it applies. So it was specifically overruled because of the Cherokee by the Cherokee Treaty. And so it does, there, you know, there is no precedent for other tribes. So, I, I, I mean, I don't know. The answer is I don't know. Um, it's just that I'm not sure that Rogers carries the weight that we've been giving it for 150 years um, or more, uh, nearly 200 years, I guess, at this point. So, yeah, it's a good, good comment. Good question. Good point. Um, law review students, do we have someone monitoring the chat? I see that we have questions. Um, so the, there's, that was actually a comment. Uh, so there aren't any questions in the, uh, the online section, but I did have a question. So Professor Riley, you mentioned that there was a point of disagreement um, between some of the panelists. I was wondering if the three of you could speak to that briefly. Well, I, I'll let everybody speak for themselves. I'll just say when I, when I just sort of threw out that I was going to talk about this case, um, and, and mentioned, you know, the issue that it, be, it being a CFR court, I think that these two gentlemen have so much experience in the area that they might have uh, more to add, more nuance to add to whether they think it's a federal or, or tribal prosecution. So, so in full disclosure, um, I'm, I'm helping to draft the uh, brief now for National Congress of American Indians as our client for Denespe, which is on behalf of the Ute Mountain Tribe and other tribes that have CFR courts. And in full disclosure, I'm actually the chief judge pro tem of the Ute Mountain Ute Tribal Court, but here's the weird wrinkle. Um, I, I'm, I'm chief judge pro tem. I only serve on conflicts cases. They 638 it, they did a contract. So I'm actually a tribal court judge and BIA actually did a memorandum and accepted that. So I don't know how that's gonna play. So it's probably better for me to just keep my mouth shut. I will tell you, though, that that just to be totally honest with you, because I represent both the tribes in Colorado, um, Ute Mountain I've represented since 2009. <clears throat> and when I became U.S. attorney in 2006, we had 15 homicides the year before I started and uh, one unexplained death, which was plainly a homicide. It was just a compromise crime scene because we had only three police officers to police an area bigger than the state of Connecticut. And the average response time was six and a half hours to a service call. And so um, we were able to deputize uh, more than 200, both, both uh, surrounding tribal Ute Mountain uh, has its own CFR police department, so that didn't help us. We beat on people to get more officers, and we did eventually get 12 at the federal level, but we, we got Southern Ute to provide backup, which is the neighboring sister tribe. And then we, we deputized the, the the surrounding county sheriffs, and then the city of Cortez, Colorado, the city of Durango police. We deputized everybody federally. And then with the tribe's consent, uh, we had a great police force and we went from uh, that many homicides, 15 official. Um, we, we've had one in the last three years. Uh, I'm very proud of the work the tribe has done. Uh, flip side is there's no freaking way we can possibly afford to do a tribal court. There's no way. Our median household income is $6,300 a year. We do not have uh, hardly any resources. We don't have any money for it unless, you know, the fairy godmother shows up and hands us a check. I don't see how it's ever going to happen. So that's the problem is with the CFR system. It's a, it's a safety net. It's not a very good safety net for the tribes that have it. It's nice to say personal opinion that that the tribe should just step up, but we were stepping up in all sorts of ways. And, you know, it, it's just not practical, in my opinion, at this time for us to create some kind of tribal police department. 
um, or tribal court system. We just don't have, we've, we've done the math many times, we just don't have the income to do it. So I've got heartburn about this case in part because, I, you know, if, 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 if it'll be perceived as a tribal loss if there's a, a double jeopardy violation found. Um, but a CFR court, I mean, let's, let's pick out the acronym, a code of federal regulations court <laughs> defined by the code of federal regulations sounds to me kind of like a federal court. This is what, that's what gives me pause. And the fact that tribes have contracted to run those courts through 638 contracts, that's what 638 contracts are when the tribe contracts to do a federal responsibility. And that's the whole theory of 638 is that tribes can do federal responsibilities better than the federal government can. And so that's why tribes can contract to, to do those things. And so that's what gives me heartburn about this case is that I actually, I see the argument pretty strongly. And, um, and so, so that's what, that's what gives me concern and pause. And again, it'll be perceived as a loss for Indian country if the, you know, um, if the court goes a different direction than they did in Gamble. And so that's what's uh, troubling to me. It's a weird case for them to take up, actually, because it's just, there, it doesn't affect very many people at all. Really unusual case. And I think probably it suggests that there's some that, you know, people disagreement among the justices about the scope of double jeopardy in a tribal context. So that's the thing that gives me gives me pause too. I just wanted to add quickly to that that there are other things that if 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 it does if the case does go against. Um, you know, if the case ultimately does say that, that it's a federal court, there are other things that I think then we would have to think about doing in Indian country, like advocating for uh, you know legislation that would increase um, sentencing in, um, in Indian country for certain crimes, et cetera. And I also just wanted to add too, the double jeopardy thing is complicated because, you know, and, and Troy is the expert here because, uh, you know, when the Indian Law and Order Commission did their report, you know, one of the things that did come out in those hearings was that there there is a concern among people on the ground in Indian country that their their members are being subject to double prosecution, whereas if they were, you know, had committed the crime outside of the reservation, they would only be prosecuted once by the state. And so there does create um, sentencing disparities that are more punitive in some cases, bizarrely, more punitive in some cases for Native defendants and then in other cases, really paltry because of the sentencing limitations. So it's it's kind of all over the place. Well, uh, hi. Um... I guess this uh, question is for Kevin. Um, so, when the Means versus Navajo Nation, um, you know, it was a you know intertribal, you know, kind of battle, um, and you know, in the Navajo Nation uh, treaty, it's you know it says that you know Navajo Nation has uh, um, prosecution uh, rights over you know any Indian uh, person. It doesn't matter if they're a citizen of the tribal uh, of the uh, Navajo Nation. Um, you know, do you see that, you know, kind of um, in cases such as that uh, expanding, you know, what it means for intertribal citizenship in the future? Wow, that's a that's an interesting big question. You know, tribes are all over the map on how they, you know, whether they allow dual citizenship with another tribe and that sort of thing. And yeah, Russell Means had had married into the Navajo Nation, and um, and I'm not sure his tribe was particularly. I mean, I don't want to carry his intertribal dispute because I don't know that his tribe was necessarily defending him in that case. He can, I mean, he was accused of committing domestic violence. He was accused of beating up his father-in-law is what I recall the facts of the case were. And he, you know, and, you know, uh, you know, all tribes care about their elders. And so, and they basically just said, we're going to prosecute him. He's a, he, you know, he is married into the tribe. Um, so we, he doesn't have any Navajo blood, but he is married into the tribe. And so they use their own formulation, which I, I respect enormously. Let, let the Navajo nation define its community itself. And um, they viewed him as a Billy Ghana, like a non Navajo. Um, um, we're all, you know, we're, we're all Billy Ghana's if we're, you know, in, I, I, if Troy, am I using that term correctly? Yeah. Sure. And so, so, but they said, nevertheless, he has sort of married into the tribe. And yeah, I think so, they were arguing on the grounds of, uh, so I'm Navajo, 
and uh, this uh, the kinship term of hatan hatan ne, which means in law. Right. Uh, that's right. So they're saying yeah. by you know him marrying into the Navajo Nation that uh, he now falls under Navajo jurisdiction. Yeah. Right. That sorry. Thank you for correcting that. That's exactly right. And I again I support that because that's tribal self determination and tribal so trying to figure out a way to exercise territorial sovereignty, um, which tribes need to create public safety. So, yeah. Thanks. I was just going to say it's an excellent question. And Paul Spruan at the Navajo Nation Department of Justice published an article. You may have seen it on the Hadene, and and it's a wonderful development of what you're talking about. I just say it's very important in our Navajo justice system. We we and I hate to say this with my wife present. We we don't follow the law of the Ninth Circuit or the Tenth Circuit unless the Navajo Supreme Court speaks. That's just something we've all signed up to do. Now, it is interesting because, of course, we take our state bar oaths. And, but, I mean, I took an oath to the Navajo Nation, and that's what we do for Navajo court. And so when you think about it, unless the U.S. Supreme Court actually speaks on a question like this, we don't care what the federal courts have to say at all. And I just want to point that out because it's totally shocking to most of my clients who go down there. They're like, what are you talking about? You don't follow the circuit courts. Well, if the U.S. Supreme Court hasn't spoken. We don't, we don't think they really apply to us. And so just kind of wrap your mind around that this Navajo law is really important in Navajo for many reasons, because it is important, uh, of course, as the rule of decision that, that has been chosen by the people there, but also because it really is much broader than you think of necessarily in some other jurisdictions. And it, as a practical matter, it will bind questions like this for a long time. So at, at Navajo, if you're an in-law, it doesn't matter who you are, if you're actually an in-law and the marriage is there, that you are an in-law. That's You are fully a member of the Navajo Nation. That's how I think it's fair to say to now look at it. So I'm going to make a comment to my co-panelists that because I learned so much from Angela's presentation, and I'm glad to know that um, that Troy is working on the um, the brief for NCAI in the Denespe case. And one of the things that uh, so Angela enlightened me about was this notion that federal funding of tribal courts might sort of because of the Puerto Rico case in part might be um, an issue um, in that support for tribal courts or, you know, for, for, for that court at any rate. But, you know, there's tons of federal funding for state courts and state criminal justice and state public safety. And a lot of the federal funding for those, you know, the cops funding, the cops grants, and there's, there's a extensive funding for states and that doesn't undermine their dual sovereignty. And I hope that there's someone writing a amicus brief or something like that in the case that's talking about all the, you know, the sources of funding that states get from the federal government without destroying their separate sovereign status. It's so muddled. I just tell you that the criminal code, for example, we use at Ute Mountain Utes is our tribes. They did the code. We don't use the federal code. Now, you may be shocked. We have a federal court, but we use the tribal code. That's all we use. So it's it when you talk about it being, I mean, I learned a lot from this presentation. Think about it being a very hybrid system. It's a very hybrid system. And it's not a very pretty system, too. It's been cobbled together. Um, you know, if they could actually get a judge pro tem through the BIA, you know, who was qualified and actually showed up for work, no offense, but I mean, there, we, we sometimes have gone seven months without having a public defender. They just don't pay for it. And, and we've gone as long as a year. And when I was U.S. attorney, we went more than a year with no tribal, no federally appointed tribal prosecutor contract. There was just no one to serve as the prosecutor. It, it's ridiculous. You can't run a justice system that way. But that's we've had to cobble all these things together. And it's not very thought out. I would say that so. Well, and just one brief point on that, that it's interesting, the United States um, brief in opposition to the cert petition really focuses on that kernel from Sanchez Vi, which is what is what is the ultimate source from which the power springs. And the ultimate source is that but for tribes inherent sovereignty, that court doesn't exist and doesn't prosecute anyone. Right. It is it's the tribe's sovereignty that is emanating out through a forum that's provided by the federal government as a mechanism until, until and, and maybe eventually, um, the tribes can set up their own tribal courts, which many, obviously many have done, because we only have five CFR our courts left. So that's that's really what the US um, government's brief focused on. And that's, that's the difference in the characterization between the two. 
I think Professor Riley's comments about uh, sovereignty and power are a good moment for announcing that the last secret word <laughs> is power. Um, <laughs> please join me in thanking this exceptional panel for starting us off this morning.